this computer. Okay, yeah, so I remember a lot when I was doing my um, undergraduate in painting and drawing and then my honours in drawing, I actually realised that I'd never been taught perspective. I didn't know really what it was, how it worked. It was just this thing that I thought, oh, this is, this is the correct drawing that I never learnt. And now I would probably be a bit more careful in my descriptions and I would say that there's definitely no correct type of drawing. The reason that I went through all those drawings by Vincent van Gogh when we worked outdoors was to show how in observational drawing, a really good eye can find an incredible wealth of new information that our brain doesn't know is there. You know, think back to the way that he drew a patch of dirt. Um, perspective, not very useful for that. Um, but what perspective is very useful for is constructing environments that kind of fit together. I think perspective is an amazing thing to kind of imagine new worlds with, because once you know how perspective works, you can kind of create things that aren't there. That is my favorite use of perspective. But as I'll show you, it has very important applications in graphics, in all 3D graphics. Um, it has important relationships to photography and architecture, lots of kind of industrial applications. But it's also something that we can, you know, learn how to draw and add it to our toolbox of um, different ways we can approach drawing. All right, so I'll try to get through this lecture quite quickly because, you know, we're, we're meant to be a far more uh, hands-on class, so I'll try to keep this stuff light. But because we're working online, I thought, okay, let's do a bit of a background um, before we get drawing. Okay, so um, this is from a, a different class I used to teach where I, let me put this on uh, present mode, this one. Okay, can you still see the screen okay? Yep, okay. So this is a lecture I used to give for a different class. Um, and it's looking at like space and spatial distortions. So the image we're looking at here is a GIF that is, well, there's someone coming in. Oh, does anybody know what this image is? Like what's happening in this image? And I can give you a clue. There's no computer graphics here. There's no special effects. The lens is different. That's right. Yeah, so the lens is different. This is what we have. It's called a, in filmmaking, it's called a dolly zoom effect. You might have seen it in that um, there are moments in films where the character looks shocked and it looks like the background around them is getting bigger. What's actually happening is usually the camera is zooming out, but at the same time, it's moving closer to the um, subject. So the subject will stay the same size, but the warping of the environment or how much of the environment that the camera can see is changing. And we create this kind of amazing effect where um, it looks like we're kind of warping the world around us. Um, but it, it kind of relates to uh, how a camera works, basically the relationship between um, the sort of the size of a lens and its field of view. Um, and and the, the way a camera works is also related to uh, the history of perspective. Okay, so let me just keep going. Okay, so I'll click through that. Okay, so for those super geeks out there, <laughs> if you wanted to get into reading about it, um, this, is, this is the text that a lot of this history comes from. Um, Erwin Panofsky is a very famous um, Russian art historian uh, whose book, Perspective as Symbolic Form, really delves into the history of uh, perspective in the West and when it emerged, it emerged historically and kind of what it means and how it changed the way we see the world. Um, so I won't go into all of the history of who Panofsky is. However, I have put all of these notes um, on the Moodle in case anyone's interested. So what Panofsky is kind of saying is a, a huge summary is he says, okay, look, there's a big difference between medieval European art and Renaissance European art, which these two examples here would be sort of an easy contrast. On the left-hand side, we have a uh, 15th century uh, Yes, I believe 15th century painting. Um, and we, the most important thing to look at here is the spatial structure. Look at the size of the people. They're all sort of almost randomly different, but in a narrative sense or a storytelling sense, they're all kind of, there's a logic to it, right? All of the important people are bigger. All of the less important people are smaller. And we can kind of understand that the people at the top of this tower are smaller because they're further away and the people at the bottom of larger because they're closer, but there's no perspective on the tower, right? We don't have any of that three-point perspective where the top of the tower is smaller. So that 
in a kind of mathematical sense doesn't make sense, but we can kind of see that, okay, there's this crane that's somehow connected to the top. But what Panofsky would say is that this is a very human way of drawing space. It has a kind of a storytelling consistency to it. Um, what it doesn't have is a mathematical consistency. And if we look at the image on the right by Raphael, um, the School of Athens. So in this case, it's representing all of the famous Greek philosophers with, um, I believe, uh, I don't know, Plato and Aristotle in the middle or something like that. Um, oh, no, no, so probably Socrates. I don't know. Look, my classics isn't that good. <laughs> it's either Socrates and Aristotle or Plato and Socrates. I don't know. Anyhow, um, the point of this image is that it's got a mathematical consistency. So can you guys see my cursor, my mouse cursor? Yep. Okay. So I'm putting my mouse cursor right where the vanishing point would be, which would be basically between the gaze of these two people. And all of these lines, every single piece of architecture is point is converging to that single point. So this is what's called single point perspective. Um, some things that we will get very familiar with by the end of today, look at how all of the faces of these buildings are directly parallel to us. I think we mentioned in class before this idea of the picture plane. The picture plane is this idea that there's a, a piece of glass between you and the world. And we can speak about things that are closer to the picture plane or further away, but also whether things are parallel to the picture plane or at an angle. And so in one point perspective, we always have one face of buildings parallel to the picture plane. That's kind of the uh, major feature of single point perspective. So we have this wall is parallel and then any wall that's not facing us is converging off to the vanishing point. So what this also means is that you have a lot of right angles, a lot of 90 degree angles in any architectural shape that is facing us. And so what Panofsky said is like, look, this is this moment in the Renaissance where um, the investigation of optics and graphics and mathematics is changing how we construct images. He's also pointing to kind of the birth of the modern era, the birth of this sort of use of mathematics and geometry to kind of structure how we see. So Panofsky's argument is that really things like perspective we can use to see kind of the origins of so many other things that we're very familiar with today. Think about our measurement systems, how um, in an extreme sense, the move from the imperial system to the metric system is this, you know, push towards very specific quantification. And in visual art, um, the emergence of perspective is, is right at the center of this. Um, and so as a history, we can find the origin of perspective going all the way back to the uh, 15th century. Um, I'll go through this really quickly, but essentially you can find this on Wikipedia. Um, these are kind of major contributors to the theory of perspective. Um, Filippo Brunelleschi, uh, Leon Battista Alberti, and these diagrams here are actually the theories that we're going to use today. This is about as complex as we'll get. We're probably going to stay roughly in the 15th century. So what this diagram in the bottom left is showing us is that, okay, we've got a grid in one point perspective, but how do we know how small, say, a series of square tiles on the floor should get as they move away from us. And this can be found in Depertura by um, Leon Battista Alberti in the 15th century. And basically, we use a series of uh, evenly divided points on the line that's closest to us. And then we use the way that diagonals intersect with these points to divide the, the shapes. And this is great if you're drawing something completely um, from your imagination. But also, as I'll show in my uh, demonstrations today, that we can use this same technique to, say, divide up a wall and to find the halfway point of a wall and where the window should go or something like that. OK, so to move forwards, we have then artists like Albrecht Dürer, um, a German Renaissance art and theorist. Um, and this is a very famous picture from the history of perspective. It can be read in a number of ways. Um, there's kind of some interesting uh, thematic things here. But I want you to look at, first of all, this thing that he's got in front of him. So what we're representing here is a very specific drawing machine. Now, can anybody guess what this thing is in front of his face? This sort of stick. He's got something standing vertically upright that we wouldn't really <laughs> expect to have. Does anybody know what it is? 
It's a map for measurement. Yes, for measurement, but more specifically, it's it's to stop him doing something, if anybody can guess. Okay, I'll, I'll rescue you. It's to stop him moving his head. It's basically a, a fixed point that he keeps in line with one eye, right? So, because if you're drawing perspective and you move your head, everything changes. Um, we saw this a little bit with the, um, the negative space drawing, same problem. Um, so what we have here is this little point to make sure he doesn't move his eye. Then we've got this grid. And then we've got, in a kind of more humorous way, the world, which not unsurprisingly for, for 15th century European art, the world was represented by a naked woman. Um, the man has locked himself inside a machine. So read into that what you will. Um, but the grid gives coordinate reference points. And then he has the same grid on his piece of paper. So the idea is that whatever is in the world gets flattened onto this grid. And let's say if her hand, if he saw it from this fixed point at one coordinate point, he should be able to transfer that hand to the exact same coordinate point flat on the paper. But what you can also see this as is a very early kind of diagram of a camera, right? Like what we know about a camera is that it, it has one, one lens, you know, one fixed point. And the job is basically to sort of flatten light onto a, a sensitive plate. And so Dura's sort of diagram of, of how perspective works starts to show us this really mechanical nature of it, that it's, you don't move your head, you're essentially looking through one eye, and then you have this precise task of transcribing and flattening the world point by point. Um, and then, okay, moving forwards, um, through the work of Rene Descartes, uh, we get uh, calculus, oh, sorry, we get calculus from Newton, um, but we get uh, analytic geometry. And basically once we're here, we essentially have the building blocks for, um, for this, right? Like what, we, what you have in a 3D graphics program is essentially, you know, it's, it's basically Cartesian geometry that is calculating every time I, I sort of scroll around this cube, the all the computer is really doing is saying, okay, what do we know about perspective? If you're looking from this point of view, how should each face be getting larger or smaller relative to the view of the camera? Then with some other clever tricks. So for the really nerdy stuff, this would be, I guess, what we get from Newton and Descartes. But as soon as we do this, we're actually, we're actually introducing some much more complex problems. For example, how do we know which faces we can see at the back and which faces we can see at the front? This is called the hidden object problem. And it's a kind of a problem that's more unique to computer graphics because when we're drawing, we can't see the back of the table, right? But the computer, when it's drawing a cube, it knows everything about the cube and it won't instinctively know from Renaissance mathematics why it can't see the back. So there's actually some quite unique um, perspective algorithms happening in 3D graphics as well. But, but uh, this stuff is basically we could call it automated perspective, um, automated, you know, uh, 16th, 17th century mathematics. Okay, so what we then get to in a much broader sense is during this kind of early modern period, we get the formalization of lots of different drawing systems. What we're going to be looking at, ignore the last week part, um, what we're going to be looking at this week is perspective projections. So perspective is when we have uh, one part of an object getting smaller as it gets further away from us and the other part of the object that's closer to us gets larger. This is what we get with perspective. All of these other ones on the left-hand side are other mathematical drawing systems that just have different rules. But the, the reason they're called parallel is that they don't have things getting larger and smaller. Everything stays the same size. So you've probably seen these either because you know about them or without realizing it um, in things like architectural diagrams, but also a lot of computer games use these early on. Um, I'm not sure if I've got this in my lecture, but if I look up like StarCraft II, for, for example, if anybody plays these games, um, all of these games were done in uh, isometric projection, if I can find a good example. Um, I mean, you can see here the way the buildings are drawn, the way that all of the um, units are the same size. This stuff was done um, by, by the time a game like StarCraft II came out, wasn't really necessary because computers were a lot better, 
But if we go to like these earlier um, isometric games, the reason that all of these games did this is that 3D graphics cards didn't really exist, or if they did, they weren't very good. Um, but if you use isometrics, you can do a really clever trick where isometric perspective gives us an, a, a good idea of space. But with a person, you can do a funny trick where you only really have to have a bunch of pictures, a picture of a person facing you, a picture of a person with their back towards you, and then a sort of a halfway view. And then you just kind of animate their legs to run around. And so you can have hundreds of characters looking like they're 3D running around space, but they're actually just in this sort of simulation of three-dimensional space. It's actually quite two-dimensional. Um, and architects use this, uh, Chinese scroll painting also uses this. Um, I've got another lecture on that, which we maybe won't get into now. But I bring this up at this point, just to remind you that even when we're in this world of kind of mathematical drawing systems, there's lots of them. And there's lots of them because there's lots of different uses for them. You will find these in the history of military calculations, furniture making. So cabinet projection here comes from furniture making, right? Like if you wanna have a diagram of a piece of furniture, you can actually have accurate measurements on that diagram if there are consistent rules. And cabinet projection usually says that all of the measurements on the front face are accurate at one-to-one -one or a fixed ratio. And then all of the measurements on the second face are one half, because for example, the you might be drawing a long table that might not fit on the page. So you kind of put everything by half, but these are a whole other class. Um, they're also quite easy to draw with once you know the rules, um, but we're gonna look at perspective. Okay, so racing forward. So back to this trick from, I believe it was Alberti, um, in one point perspective, what Alberti would have said is, we draw a horizontal line with evenly spaced marks. Uh, we have a distant point of, and a vanishing point, two distant points and a vanishing point. These are just little technical things that uh, can be used to, um, to set the system up. Um, we draw lines from the base and uh, draw them to the vanishing point. So that gives us the first part of our, of our perspective grid. And then we start to draw a series of lines from all of the horizontal points connecting to our distance points. And we just draw a whole bunch of those. And where these lines connect, we can draw uh, horizontal lines at the intersection of all of these distance points. And we get that clever thing of a grid floating in space. So now this kind of looks like, you can imagine maybe it's like a, a grid of tiles sitting in the desert somewhere, right? And from there, we can project shapes. So this is just something I made in Photoshop that once you have the grid, you can just, you know, pro I, I just basically drew some cubes and projected them up. And then I used the same sort of rules from the, the floor grid uh, to draw these shapes. And you can see that the higher you move shapes, the less of the top you see, right? So if you have a shape that's right in line with the vanishing point, you won't see the top or the bottom. And then if you have a shape that's higher than the vanishing point, you'll see um, even more. And then I just did a very simple shading trick where I made three tones, one for the highlight, one for the mid-tone, one for the shadow, and I just flood filled them. But it's, you know, it's kind of spatially convincing. So then two-point perspective. And I'm gonna go into in a second how we would know which one to use. And maybe I'll see if someone can guess it, um, but I'll show you what it is first. So in two-point perspective, um, we still have a horizon line. We have a starting point. Um, and then we have uh, two vanishing points. And here again, if we were to set this up in abstract, this is how we do it. But in our drawing exercise, I'll, I'll make it even simpler. Um, but we do a similar thing. So we have this starting point, we draw a horizontal line, and then we make equal marks. And guys, I'm recording this, so you don't need to remember all of this. It's just kind of a general explanation. Um, and then basically you do, you do a similar trick to one point perspective, but you're overlapping um, and using both of these perspective grids. So then again, we've got this floating grid um, in our desert and we can do the same thing. We can draw shapes and we can kind of place them anywhere vertically that we want. And then uh, some other tricks, and this works for both one point and two point. And this is stuff that we're gonna use more today is what if, for example, if we're back here, if this was a building and let's say there was a door in the middle of this, um, of this wall, how do we know where the middle is? So I can tell you that the middle is not going to be in the middle of this shape because we know 
that this shape is getting larger as it moves towards us and smaller as it moves away from us. So what that means is that this middle point will also be affected by this sort of warping of perspective. Now, of course, because I projected this up from a grid, we could probably cheat and just go down and see where the, the middle of the grid square would be. But there's another trick that we'll get from Alberti. And what that is, is using the diagonals of this face. So this face is what's called a trapezoid or a trapezium. And the way we find the central point of a trapezium in perspective is to simply draw two diagonals and where they intersect will give us the middle in perspective. So I've done this again here. I've made a building and to find the middle point, I've drawn these two green diagonals and then drawn this red line to show you where that sort of imaginary middle point would be. And then we can do another trick where if we want to divide it into thirds, we can do, we can use a second diagonal going through the first diagonal. So I believe, gosh, can I remember exactly how this works? We have our first two diagonals that gives us the middle point. And then using that middle point, we draw another diagonal here. And then we would have one third marker and the second third marker. So it's a little bit tricky, but after you practice it a few times, you'll kind of get the hang of it. Dividing things into thirds, you don't need to do it as often, but I just wanted to show you that this is sort of, I think this is connected to things like third based geometry. Like if anybody has ever looked into, or in the future wants to get interested in all of the Greek geometry, golden sections and golden ratios, a lot of that comes from dividing shapes using their diagonals. It's kind of, it's kind of like geometry before you have calculus essentially. Okay. Okay, so then you could draw a building like this, right? By like, you know, dividing things into um, equally using intersecting diagonals. And this is the third perspective system that we're not going to use today because we're probably not going to be drawing things that are really high. But I guess um, because there'll be a bit of variation in the subjects that you might draw at home, um, you, you might want to be aware of this. So three point perspective is the one you'd see in a comic book, right? Like that sort of huge exaggeration of the spatial axis, very common in things like Spider-Man, right? Where like you'll have the character either on the top of the building looking down or someone on the street looking up. So basically I'll go back uh, for three point perspective. We have the same setup as two point perspective at the base, but we've added this high vanishing or third vanishing point, which can either be above or below our horizon line. And what that does is that it adds in the final plane of recession, um, which is as things get further away from us vertically, we also account for them by scale. So here um, to project this grid up, we can project any point from the grid that we've drawn on the ground and just make sure that they all converge at that vanishing point. So really the only difference is that instead of these lines being vertical, they're all now going to the vanishing point. And so that would allow us to draw sort of buildings or, or floating shapes. And in the same way, we can reverse it, right? So we can have the exact same grid. I've just moved it up on the page. And then I've projected down all of these lines to give us the idea that we are high up looking at the top of this building and that the base is, is a long way down. Okay, so that's kind of an overview of the three perspective systems. And I, I wanted to show you sort of a, some of the uses of these. So like, this is a photograph that I took uh, on the top of Line Rock. And I took it in a way that it, it kind of felt like it could be used for some perspective montage. Um, and because it's coming from a camera, every image that comes from a camera typically can be um, manipulated using perspective. Because as we saw in that original image from Albert Dura, that um, you know, cameras and perspective are, are very closely linked in their function. So here, basically, I, I worked out where the horizon was, even though it wasn't a very clear day. Um, and then I just did essentially a one-point perspective, kind of using what the buildings seemed to be doing. It wasn't really clear. Like if you're in a, a gridded city, it's incredibly easy to pick. But I just did a bit of a guess here. And I used this to just, I don't know, make this sort of floating image. And then I added a few other tricks of shading. Uh, I made this grass um, to make sure it was on top. So I kind of masked out the bits of the building at the back. And then I put these little trees of my own here. And the only final trick I added was this little shadow. Um, and these are little tricks that if you're working with perspective and, and making sort of imaginary worlds for yourself, things like 
perspective and then shading and consistent shading all help to kind of create forms of illusion. So I think perspective drawing to me, the most useful thing about it is that it helps you understand how different images work and then you can start to work with them. So to me, photo montage is a great example where if you understand perspective, you can transform a photograph from just a flat kind of static image into kind of a world that you can interact with as well, as long as you know kind of how its space functions. Um, and again, I've put all of this in a PDF um, in, the, uh, da, 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 in the Moodle. Um, so I've given some more uh, examples of like quite complex um, drawing uh, perspective tutorials and some, some more historical examples as well. Okay, um, blah, blah, blah. I don't think we need to go into anything more. Okay, there's a lot of <laughs> interesting theory at the end that we won't go into. Um, and yeah, there's some artistic examples that I think are great if anyone's interested. Uh, Julie Maritu is a fascinating artist who does quite a lot with um, architectural space and perspective. Um, and yeah, I think that's the end of this lecture. Okay, so now what I wanna do is bring us back to the task that we're going to do today. So I took these two images this morning. This is um, <laughs> the space outside my office. And I want to know, can somebody tell me which perspective system I would use with which image? And this is going to be important for how you draw today. So I'll start with the one on the, on the right. Oh, sorry, on the left. I'll make it more difficult. To draw this image here, what, would, what perspective system would make sense? Is it one point perspective? I would say no. There's a reason. So I, I couldn't find a great example, but this was the best I could get. I would say that the image on the right is better for one point perspective, this one. And the reason is, if we go back to um, this image from Raphael here, remember this idea of having certain faces of the buildings facing you, parallel to you. Whereas if we go back to here, the way I took these images was to try to make a contrast. Here, this wall is parallel to us, it's facing us. And if you look at the corridor, it's got that very strong one perspective look. Here, it, it's a narrow corridor, so I couldn't get a great shot, but we're kind of facing the corner. And so I did that deliberately because if you're facing a corner, generally that means you've got two walls that are at an angle to you. And if the walls are at an angle to you, you've got the option to make it a two point perspective drawing. So what I'm going to recommend today is that um, you pick a point in a room. Now you can go, uh, you can do it at home, but if at home is too small, um, you can uh, find somewhere in your building or, or wherever, wherever is uh, convenient. But I want you to choose a space where either you're, you've got one plane that's facing you like this, and with, with enough kind of interesting stuff in front of it. Don't just sit in front of a wall because it will be very boring to draw. Give yourself kind of an environment. So either with one plane facing you where you can kind of imagine where there will be a single vanishing point or with kind of facing a corner. And if you're facing a corner, you're going to have a two point perspective. And I'm just going to quickly like get this started on Photoshop as a little demonstration. I haven't kind of rehearsed this super well. So I'm kind of hoping this should work, but let's start with the, um, the single point perspective one, which will be this image here. Now, have I set, I just got to check up, set up some layers so I can delete this in case I screw it up. Okay, so first of all, we can kind of experiment with where the, um, with where, have I got my pencil? Yes, with where the vanishing point will be. So if I draw a, why am I not getting my line there? Okay, sorry, I think I keep, going to a color picking tool. Obviously I don't use Photoshop that often. Okay, that's what I want, all right. So, and this isn't Photoshop, this is the free version. So, all right, I'm just gonna kind of play around with where my vanishing point would be. I'm just gonna take a bunch of these lines and see kind of where everything joins. It's probably gonna be in the middle of those doors somewhere. Yeah, something. Yeah, all right, so it looks like the vanishing point is a little bit high, probably just to do with the angle where I took the photo. So I'll just undo that. So now we kind of know where the vanishing point would be. So you can experiment with this yourself. But to me, it was somewhere like here. So once we know that, 
the only other thing we really need to know is where does our drawing finish, right? Like we encountered this problem when we were drawing outdoors um, that if the whole, if we're drawing the whole world around us, at some point we need to decide where the drawing starts. Because obviously we can't draw what's under our feet because we'd sort of be looking down. So you pick a point where it sort of seems uh, convenient. Maybe it will be like here or something. And what I would do now, I suggest you do this with a ruler. You know, it, I think if you're working with perspective, it's perfectly fine to use a ruler um, because it is a, a mathematical system. So I would sort of work out where my um, where my drawing is going to going to start and finish, and then I would start to draw these first trapeziums. So I would take this line here, and every line has to finish at the vanishing point. So, okay, I guess it would be nice if I make my canvas size a little bit bigger. Hold on. Uh, da, da, da. And I know this is weird doing this on Photoshop, but it honestly seemed to me to be a little, to be the best way to demonstrate it online. Uh, like that. Okay, so let's say like maybe I'm drawing my trapezium. So here you can, ee, okay, I'm, I need to make a new layer, sorry. You can see I'm drawing my trapezium and we've got this problem that we've got to have our first trapeziums actually fit on the page. So this will be a bit of a bit of playing around to basically find a place where um, you can set up your system and things will fit on the page. So let's, I'm just kind of going to imagine that maybe my drawing would be, I don't know, something maybe like this. And the good thing with um, one point perspective drawing is you've got a lot of horizontal and vertical lines. So all your horizontal lines will be, uh, you know, perfectly parallel to the edge of the page, as will all of your vertical lines. So once I've sort of got trapeziums like this set up, here actually, oh yeah, and then I'd, I'd look at where this wall finishes. So I'd have here a vertical line, and look, I haven't, <laughs> haven't drawn this super well. Maybe I should have zoomed in a bit more, but you get the point. Um, so now I'd have the door drawing in here. And then I'd look at things like the elevator doors. Um, and we could perhaps imagine that it might actually be that case where it's divided by thirds. So we have this door kind of, okay, so we've got an elevator door, a gap, an elevator door, a gap, an elevator door, and then another gap. So what we could guess is that maybe this, if this part was in the middle and I was, drawing it with perspective. Now, the weird thing here is that I'm kind of tracing a photo. You won't be tracing a photo, right? Your drawing will, will look more like this, right? You're trying to, try to find the perspective of this image. I'm just trying to show you it this way because if I did it with a webcam, yeah, I think it will be even more complex. Um, but you know, if I wanted to find this point, I would join our diagonals here like this of this trapezium. And then, okay, so the middle point of this trapezium is actually here. So that hasn't helped us that much. Um, so perhaps, perhaps this could be a third. So to find the third of that space, I would look at, I'd take this shape here and I would make its diagonal again to our trapezium. And then this is a third, okay. And basically once you've got these trapezium shapes built up, you can start to divide your planes accurately and, and kind of find a home for everything. And the second thing I would point out to you, which I'll, I'll do again in the second image, is that if, if you come to drawing something like, like this, um, this elevated door, it looks really great if you can actually realize that, see here, the door is not just a flat shape drawn onto the wall, it has its own thickness. So it's actually, if I just, I'll just draw it for you quickly. The, draw, the door itself has its own thickness. See, it, it comes out from the wall. So it would have kind of a thickness like this. And that's what will give your drawing kind of a real sense of constructed space is that it's not only where the elevator door is, it's that every object architecturally tends to have a thickness and a dimension to itself. And all of these things you want to build into your perspective drawing. So perspective drawing, it is really a form of sometimes it feels like carving or sometimes it feels like 
like building something out of little pieces of like little pieces of wood. But I really want you to think about how every single shape connects to every other shape and how much you can sort of uh, fit that into the perspective system. So I'll switch over to one point perspective now. Uh, sorry, two point. So two points a little different, right? Because we don't have that kind of system where everything is pointing to the one place. Um, I'll do the same trick. I'll make my image a little smaller. Maybe something like that. And I'll just move it into the middle. What I recommend with a two point perspective, which I think is a little easier, is instead of starting with kind of the single point um, to register your drawing, you want to find that line will be your beginning line, that, that place that you're facing, which will be a corner. And if you're outside, often it's a corner of a building and these walls will be moving away from you. But if you're inside, it's the opposite, right? They're moving towards you. So think about it, whether you're, I could show you here, it's like whether you're on the inside or on outside of a box. So if I um, remove these faces, if you're outside, oh, and I could even do a, is that gonna help? Yeah, maybe that will work a little bit. If you're outside, right, these two walls will be moving away from you, but that will be the point that you're facing. And if you're inside, it's the opposite, right? The walls are moving towards you, whilst you're facing that edge. So if you're inside and outside, the perspective will sort of be doing the opposite thing. Um, right, but this is an inside example. So here, we'd start with um, our center, center line and just work out where it's going to be. Then we've got to work out where the other two vanishing points are going to be. And you can kind of play around a little bit. So say if I um, sort of just mark some lines here and just see where we'd end up, what you're going to find with two-point perspective is that often the perspective um, vanishing points that you see are not going to fit on your page. So often you want, you're going to move them closer together so they fit on your page, and that's going to kind of exaggerate the perspective. So I'll just show you kind of messing around here. This one is easier to find. The other one would be where these two walls sort of go together. And because we're almost facing this wall a bit more, they're actually going to be a long way away. See, they're not even going to fit on my kind of Photoshop page. Um, so this wouldn't help. So what I would do in this circumstance is I would put maybe this vanishing point kind of, I need to make a new, a new layer again because it's not big enough. Um, I might put the pink, the one vanishing point here and the other vanishing point here, maybe just to the side of my, at least on my drawing board or, or somewhere that's still close enough that you can mark it. And then I would start to construct my drawing. So if I hid the, the image and I had two vanishing points here, I'll just make a white layer so we can um, see what we're doing. So if I had um, two vanishing points here and then this vertical line, then we can kind of imagine, okay, so if this wall is coming towards us, then I guess it would be something like I'd start a point at this vanishing point and I'd take it through that wall. This Hopefully this makes a little bit more sense as we're drawing. And then I'd start at this vanishing point and I'd go through here. And then what we would have, if I just, I'll just grab a different color and make it a bit thicker. So you can see kind of what I'm doing. I'll put that on a different layer. Uh, so just let me make it thicker. I'll make it 10 pixels. So now what we would have is our walls will be like this. And I'll bring back the, the um, so now if I hide, hide the first pink one, whoop, beep, beep, beep. of course I was drawing on my white background. Great Photoshopping, Peter. Um, Okay, so this is kind of what we get. Once we've brought the vanishing points closer to each other, the perspective gets a little bit more warped, but it, it's still kind of practical to draw that we know that every time, um, every time we kind of draw uh, with our vanishing points, at least we've got them on the page and we can keep constructing things using the consistent reference of these two vanishing points. But of course, if I bring back my image, you'll see that um, you know, we've ended up with something very different. Um, because the photograph in this case 
was taken with a kind of a more normal lens. So we didn't have an extreme warping. Um, but for, for when you're drawing from observation here, if you're drawing facing a corner, I'd like you to, um, to uh, recognize that, set up a two point perspective system. And then from there, um, you know, you, you can still uh, do all, your, all of your construction. So if I go back to this layer, you know, we just keep going and we could do the same thing with, you know, if we wanted to find halfway points, we, we'd have all the same things. So this would be our halfway point. And then perhaps, you know, maybe there's a, a door going through there. So it would come, you know, maybe, maybe there was a door like this. And maybe the door had a thickness. And if the door had a thickness here, its thickness would be related to this vanishing point, right? So like if there was a thick object coming out of the side of the wall, it will be doing that. And then that might've put our floor sort of, so you're gonna have, it might put our floor kind of like that. So let me just grab an eraser and simplify this. Now, all of this might seem a little bit abstract for you at the moment, but once you get started, hopefully you'll just end up in a nice kind of problem solving area where the more little details you add, the more you'll have to kind of carve in and out of your drawing. So what I've done with that door is to sort of show you a shape coming out of the wall with a thickness using both of these perspective systems. So what I'm gonna ask all of you to do is to find a location and to set up a drawing. And now this will take time. Um, oh, someone's in the waiting room. This will take time. And I recommend that you definitely use pencil, not pen, because there'll be lots of correcting that you need to do. And also think about the weight of the line you use. There's going to be a lot of what we call construction lines that are just, as you can see in my demonstration here, a lot of just calculating and working stuff out. So I would keep these lines quite light. And then once you're confident that that line will actually represent an object in the drawing, then make that line a little bit heavier so we can kind of see what we're drawing. Um, later on, you might use your kneadable eraser and lighten those construction lines a bit but you're probably gonna need them for a while. Um, so yeah, so these are basically the two variables that we will be working with, one point perspective and two point perspective. Um, all of the notes for what I've just discussed are in a PDF on the Moodle. And I've also just recorded this whole thing. So whilst you get started, I'm gonna just stop this recording and I'll just put this video um, up on YouTube so that you can refer back to it if you need to, but also I'll stay on the Zoom and the Discord. So what I'll suggest now is that you all go and get started drawing. And then let's come back, I'd say in uh, one hour um, and have a look. But I'm guessing you might have questions as you're going. So if you're looking at something and, you, and you're stuck, and you don't know what to do, take a picture of your drawing, a picture of what you're looking at, and I'll see if I can help kind of solve the problem. But what I want to sort of remind you of um, finally again, is that this is, it's really different to, um, to uh, the observational drawing we've been doing the last few weeks. We're not now looking at this sort of pure observation. We're actually trying to build up a system on a piece of paper and to fit the world into that system. It's quite a, quite a different approach. Um, but uh, hopefully through some trial and error, you can get it to work and, um, and get some successful perspective drawings. Okay, are there any questions before we get started? Okay, in that case, what I'll do is I'll leave um, the Zoom running and I've got the Discord here so I can field questions from either and I'll encourage you all to go and get started. All right, I'll see you soon.